Hello everyone, welcome to this uh, lecture on whether or not the Earth has rights. I'm Dr. Alex Carter. I am Academic Director for Philosophy and Interdisciplinary Studies at the Institute of Continuing Education. Uh, this lecture is taken from the Undergraduate Certificate in Philosophy, where we talk about a range of social and political issues. And this is one of them, this question of whether or not the Earth has rights, and indeed whether or not we have rights. So one thing that will come up as we go through this is, is the, the idea that we definitely want to value the environment. But one of the, the things that is done most often is that the attempt is made to justify that action on the basis of the Earth having rights, or indeed on the basis of human beings having rights and needing the environment. So the question of rights comes up either directly or indirectly. If it comes up directly, i.e. if we want to say the Earth has rights, then we need to extend rights to not just human beings, but to non-human entities, things like animals, the environment, but also things like castles and works of art, also trees and so on. I'll explain this more as we go through, but it's important to recognize that we're talking here about moral rights, that we're talking about an ethical issue, not a legal issue. You do have rights, <laughs> I promise you, uh, legal rights, but the question we're asking is, do we have moral rights? And if we do, where do they come from and why do we have them? So one thing we have to consider is that we might not have moral rights. Rights might only be legal. We might not actually have a moral right to anything. Now, to be clear, saying that we don't have rights isn't equivalent to saying that we're advocating harm. We're not saying that therefore we should hurt each other or we should, we should act badly towards each other. What we're saying is if we act well towards each other, it's not on the basis of someone having a right. So the existence of rights comes into question. And notice when people are questioning rights, it's not, again, because they want to harm others. It's because perhaps they want an even more secure basis for treating people well. So, for instance, the Declaration of Human Rights is enshrined, but on paper. And it doesn't take an awful lot for someone to come along and just tear up your rights. So if they tear up your rights, where have your rights gone? If it was just paper rights, then what are we going to now use as a basis for treating people properly and well? So the question uh, that we're asking is what grounds the Universal Direct Declaration of Human Rights or what grounds are good treatment of other people? It's not about, oh, well, I can point to this piece of paper or not. The question is whether or not we have a moral obligation first, and that's what generates the legal obligations that follow. One philosopher in particular who looks at this and looks at the question of environment is Honora O'Neill, who is also a legislator. She's in the House of Lords, so she has to think about both the practical application of this, but also the theoretical questions as well. And she says, most of us agree that we should treat, uh, should value the environment, or at least some bits of the environment, well. Um, but what she does, what she goes on to say, is that few of us agree about why we should do this, why we should treat the environment. Uh, well and, and act well towards the environment. So the question then becomes, where do these rights come from? I've already suggested that perhaps they come from paper, perhaps they come from the law, but that seems uh, counterintuitive because we want to say, well, the law comes from the moral rights, not the moral rights coming from the law. So we don't necessarily want to go to the paper solution immediately. Maybe it comes from our rationality, though. We are unique beings, human beings. Maybe this is why we talk more about rights and why we're interested in rights and why we, we always affirm our rights, it's because we're rational entities. We have things that we want to plan for in the future. We have hopes and dreams and aspirations. Since we have those, we are an end in ourselves. We have plans. We, we, we don't use other people to affect our plans. So people are an end in themselves, says Kant. And Kant is, of course, one of the names most associated with discussions of rights. And Kant was very keen to emphasize that we are rational beings. And our rationality is perhaps what gives us those rights. So, of course, he would say perhaps that animals don't have rights because they're not rational. However, that's caused some people to question and, and, and doubt the, the validity of that claim, because we do think that animals should be treated well and that the environment should be treated well. So we don't necessarily just immediately say that they don't have rights. So maybe reason does play a part, but it's in identifying where the rights should be assigned. Maybe what, what, the, what reason's role is to do is to identify when rights exist and when they don't exist. But some will then say, what if we can't find those rights? What if we can't identify those rights? 
in the world itself? And if we can't, then are we just making this up? And if so, it can just apply to human beings since we exist within a society where we've made up this idea of rights. So either rights exist in the world or we've made them up. Reason has a role to play here, but is it one of identifying or is it one of constructing? Well, Peter Carruthers asked this question and he says that um, it seems wrong to us to suppose that rights in here in the things that we want to preserve. So ancient buildings, oak trees and works of art matter greatly to many of us without having moral standing, he says. Things that lack moral standing may nevertheless have some indirect moral significance to us, giving rise to moral duties in a roundabout way. So even the legitimate owner of a medieval castle may be under a moral obligation not to destroy it, since this would deprive present and future generations of a source of wonder, he says. So the value is still a human value, it's, but it's not located in the objects themselves, but we can still nevertheless talk about obligations to the environment. But some will object that this makes it very anthropocentric, that it's all about human beings. But there is some sense to that, if, if that is the case, because, of course, trees don't matter to trees. Trees matter to humans and not necessarily all humans. But equally, not everything in nature matters to us. We don't value some things and we value other things. So where the question then becomes, what are we to value? And this is where Honora O'Neill comes back in and she says, well, look, we need to talk about whether or not there are real values in the world, like the furniture of the universe. So here I'll just quote the last bit, the values, whatever they may be, whatever these things are we're talking about in the, in the universe, are part of the furniture of the universe and make their claims regardless of whether there is any audience, let alone an attentive audience for the claims. So there might be things that are valuable just in and of themselves. But notice, and the reason I put it in bold, this, this question of whatever they may be, we don't know what they are, which is odd, because we do know what should what we should and shouldn't do. What, what O'Neill is talking about here is the difference between intrinsic and instrumental value. Some things can have intrinsic value in and of themselves, and some things have value only for what they give to us. Now, maybe we can have both, but we, we often find that when we talk about intrinsic value, it's very hard to maintain that conversation without lapsing into discussions of why it's valuable to us. So for instance, the purity of water is something we might think of as intrinsically valuable, clean and pure and fresh water, fantastic, that's great for drinking. So we immediately then insert a, 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 an instrumental value at the end. So it's not a coincidence what we find intrinsically valuable, because what we find valuable is what is useful to us for our survival, for our benefit, and so on. So our obligations to nature, she says, are generated by our capacity to act. And I'm going to explain a little bit about what that means now. So what O'Neill's talking about is the fact that I can either harm the environment or not harm the environment. Right now, I am either poisoning a river or not poisoning a river. I must be doing one or the other. According to logic, I must be doing P or not P, and P can stand for any action. I must either be using too much energy or not enough energy. Uh, it must be one or the other. So the, once we have that established, that I must be doing P or not P, then the question becomes, which one is the best thing to do? And we can then use reason, and here comes reason again, to try and explain which one is the best course of action. So for instance, Honora O'Neill raises an interesting but rather strange question. She says, imagine if we should injure the most people possible. Imagine if that was our goal, to injure as many people as possible. Well, that would be self-defeating because the people we would injure would then be unable to injure others. So we can't justify injuring others. Ah, so we can't justify P. We can justify not P, however, not injuring others. So now we have a principle of non-injury. Maybe we couldn't justify the principle of non-injury, but through proving that we can't, in, we shouldn't injure others, we can now prove that we should be doing the opposite. So that's now going to generate obligations in us to act. So very succinctly, what we're talking about here is our agency generates this question. The question is then answered by reason. And then the reason provides us with our obligations towards nature or the environment, but does not confer rights upon it. So O'Neill says, it is our human interests that drive us. It is our agency that drives us. It's not the rights of things in the world, because that's mysterious. That's open to question, she says. So this raises all sorts of questions that we can continue asking. We can ask the question, do rights exist? And if yes, who has them? What has them? 
If no, what generates our obligations to act morally? If, we, if it's not for rights, then what is it for? Can we avoid anthropocentrism? Do we need to? And does anthropocentrism entail a kind of speciesism where we're, we're being almost racist, but, but towards human beings? What is the role of reason in determining the best course of action going forwards? So those are the questions that we would be asking at the end of the course, where you can then start thinking about what, how you're going to apply some of these ideas. And what you would do is you would apply these within these particular courses that we have on offer. One is, is the undergraduate certificate in philosophy, which deals in particular with social and political philosophy, the topic I've just been talking about. Another is the undergraduate diploma in creativity, theory, history and philosophy. But what I want to hear also is are your questions, your thoughts on this topic. So we'll open up for a Q&A using the Q&A function. Thank you.